sorry, I uh, didn't complete the last sentence. The fact of sheer historical contingency, the experience of catastrophic historical rupture, thus yield a new historical period, a new historical space of experience, the liminal space of unprecedented historical trauma, the historical experience of being abandoned by history. Right? Rather than coming into nationhood, right? lots of people actually finding themselves completely dislocated, right? Nothing that they had ever expected, even if they were Pakistani nationalists, right, had actually come to pass. I mean, lots of people, I mean, if you actually look at what many people thought, right, at the popular level, for instance, at what Pakistan would be, it comprises almost all of what is today India, right? There are very small portions of it that are left over, right? So almost all of what is today India would also be part of Pakistan. I've even seen maps, right, that it, it include parts of West Asia and Central Asia, right? So th these are at the popular level, right? But also amongst some people who were otherwise thought of themselves as thinkers. So for these people, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm going to try to, well, not here, but nevertheless, one of the things to pay attention to is that this is a very strange time period in which people have the capacity to imagine things, right, which, um, really have very little to do with reality, but bring into existence realities, right? So consumerism, et cetera, all of this is happening at this time, right? In the early, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, right? People are exposed to advertisements. There's a lot of consumerism going on. And there is a link between the forms of imagination, right? These fantastical forms of imagination that we have. Uh, there's a book about the relationship between the emergence of romanticism in the late 18th century and the emergence of consumerism then, right? So you can similarly locate uh, the space of national imagination, the imagination of nations, as having taken place in this weird new space of the human imagination, right? <coughs> what does it mean to inherit such a historical condition? Is not such inheritance a work of endless mourning? Now this, I'm... But with this sentence, I'm leaving the space of what would be acceptable as historical <laughs> research, right? Uh, because now I'm moving into much more questions of ethics and literature, right? Uh, what does it mean to inherit such a historical condition? Is not such inheritance a work of endless mourning? Should not its investigation and articulation be the first order of business for the historiography of Pakistan or indeed South Asia? Right. In this historical essay, I seek to show that such work of inheritance and mourning, investigation and representation of the experience of historical exile has indeed been attempted, though not alas, in any of associated with historians or social scientists. I speak of the work of a literary community, a community whose of cons constitutes a singular event in the literary history of Pakistan. I speak of Intizar Hussain, who is a, uh, a very important writer of fiction, and his literary circle, especially the poet Nasir Kazmi, whose friendship with Hussain is one is often valued as the defining partnership of Pakistan's literary history. Insar Hussain has long been identified with nostalgia. So, um, you know, the literary scene in Pakistan has been dominated by the left, and the leftists will often abusively, derogatorily call him nostalgic, right? So this is a term of, a progressive term of abuse. Inzar Hussain has long been identified with nostalgia. From early in his writing career, which began for him with the need to make sense of the traumatic experience of the partition riots and migration in 1947, Inzar Hussain has been called Rajat Pasan, from the Arabic word, uh, uh, my pro Arabic pronunciation is not very good, Raja, right? The return, and has been accused of nostalgia. The former term, Rajat Pasan, is a neologism invented from Rajat, meaning return or the act of returning that came into the language in the first half of the 20th century for the purpose of translating reactionary into the lexicon of the Urdu speaking left, right? So there are all kinds of neologisms, all these terms which are now completely naturalized in Urdu are really inventions of this time period. With characteristic irony, Inzar Hussain has appropriated this appellation for himself, thus not just subverting the derogatory connotations of the word, but gesturing towards its meaninglessness as a category. The latter, nostalgia, they call it in Urdu, nostalgia, 
right, is of course a direct transliteration of the English nostalgia, a linguistic origin, which adds to its authority as a critical category. The word nostalgia, even in English, has a very interesting history. I mean, it was coined in 1678 right, by this fellow Johannes Hofer, a Swiss doctor, right? And really, for most, almost uh, uh, its entire history has been uh, a medical term, right? So it's a disease. So Napoleon's surgeon, for instance, opens up um, the skulls of soldiers who have died from nostalgia and finds a certain suppuration in a certain part of the brain, right? So our entire battalions are lost to nostalgia, right? So um, yeah, you know, this, this, of course, is unrecognizable to us, but I'm suggesting that this sense of it being a kind of disease of some sort carries over into the way that even social scientists casually use the term. I mean, I, I, I encountered this even in graduate school. Every time, you know, you, uh, you would have a book like Colonizing Egypt, Timothy Mitchell's Colonizing Egypt, they'd say, oh, well, he's nostalgic, as if that had some kind of analytical purchase. To my mind, it has no analytical purchase because I, it makes no sense to me to say that everything gets better and better. All There's a lot of stuff that was much better in the past, and that's becoming clearer by the day. Um, neither of these terms, in fact, captures Intizaro Sen's complicated, not to say impossible, relation to the past. The undifferentiated attitude of the progressist understanding, progressist, not something of a neologism, that is subscribing to the idea of progress, which is just an idea, it's not a natural historical fact. The undifferentiated attitude of the progressist understanding and program of history towards the question of the past and the present's relationship to it, accentuated in the post-colonial culture of defeat, has made it difficult to appreciate Intzaro Sen's unique understanding of history and its claims. Indeed, this is despite Intzaro Hussain's explicit avowals that nostalgia does not imply a desire for the return of the past, and for all the accusations to the contrary, it is difficult to see who actually desires such a return, since neither the right nor the left has any sense of loss. Right? The one thinking that things are forever getting better, the other that the past is simply still available in the present. Right? An attitude which neither recognizes loss nor appreciates historical difference, the pastness of the past. Right? That's what loss is about, after all. You simply don't have access to it, it's lost. One of these avowals comes in a critical essay from 1959, Ijtamai Tazib or Afsana, Collective Civilization and Fiction, which strikingly like Walter Benjamin's essay, a very important essay for me, The, story of, uh, the Storyteller, laments the consubstantial waning of storytelling and experience. So the very ability to experience things is lost, is, as he's saying, and together with that, the casual ability to tell stories about things. Right? A capability that seemed inalienable to us, the securest amongst our possessions, has been taken from us, the ability to share experiences. This is Walter Benjamin. That's a quote from him. And this erosion of experience has become the ground for the fact that the storyteller, in his living efficacy, is by no means a force today. And just as Benjamin's essay referenced a range of secular productive forces of history, Benjamin says that this ability the loss of experience and the ability to relate experience has to do with the development of technology, essentially, most importantly, which ruptures the very space of experience. As the cause of this erosion, so too does Intizaro Sen. Now, this is a, a quote from Intizaro Sen. In Lahore, where I now live, there are clean, straight, shining roads armed with buses on which neither one's steps nor one's imagination can go astray. One's steps are stopped by buses and one's imagination by advertisements from strain. Advertisements which get in the way of one's sight from inside the buses, the walls outside the buses. He's writing this in 1959. On the foreheads of shops, the top of buildings, in a word from every fortification. In fact, we have crossed the threshold of civilization by means of these advertisements. I'll repeat that sentence. In fact, we have crossed the threshold of civilization by means of these advertisements. In our settlement, that is in the pre-partition North Indian um, town of Dubai, which is where he's from, everyone knew that things made from shisham, which is a kind of wood, were beautiful and durable. One's own experience confirmed this. A catapult made from the wood of the mango tree was not durable, nor could you make a decent gilly danda. It's a kind of gaming toy comprising two pieces of wood out of it. Yes, but deol wood, another kind of wood, made for a good catapult as well as a remarkable gilli. And if you could get your hands on a shisham catapult, then Allah be praised, mashallah. Right? We were not convinced of the virtues of shisham and deol by advertisements. 
There was generations of experience at work behind this conviction, and because we had a relationship with trees, this experience of generations became our personal experience as well. But that Coca-Cola is better than all sherbets, right? There is no generations of experience at work behind this idea. Coca-Cola had just arrived when he is writing this, right? Nor have we ourselves tried to test it. We have gained this wisdom through advertisement. Inzar Hussain's essay also explores in the same essay the nature of the pre-modern society that made possible the form and content of traditional storytelling, specifically the Dastan. Very roughly, these are Urdu romance novels. A huge Dastan was recently translated uh, from the Urdu by Musharraf Ali Faruqi called the Dastan Amir Hamza, the adventures of Amir Hamza. Right? So specifically the Dastan, traditional storytelling, and the various forces and developments, both colonial and modern, that have ruptured this traditional society, simultaneously fragmenting the relation of entities, so humans, animals, stones, supernatural beings, to each other, as well as the relationship of the artist, since he is not yet an author, there's a difference between the two, to the collectivity. This quote, in the Dastans, he tells us, Humans, animals, plants, and stones are not separate species, but different classes of the same community, Biradri. The further back you go, the more related and tightly knit this community will appear. The, this is a theme, Ramatuli, um, in, that runs through Walter Benjamin's work as well. This community that comprises humans, animals, plants, right, angels, all kinds of supernatural beings that you know, very much exist in the same kind of community. Through this exploration of the world of the Dastan, in contrast to the contemporary world, in which the borders of various entities have been clearly demarcated against each other, Inzar Hussain seeks to understand the challenges that confront the contemporary post-colonial writer if his art is to have an enabling link to the collectivity, specifically the challenge of such a writer's relationship to the past. In this context, Inzar Hussain cites the newspaper reports about the Japanese soldiers who have been found hiding in in 1959, right? found hiding in the forest since the Second World War and believe that they are on the front. Right? So this is 14 years later. Right? And says, I like the, the quote, I like the attitude of these soldiers, but I would want an alteration in it. That being that one should live in the past, but while residing in the present. If for the sake of elaboration, I present this as a personal problem, then I should say that, sir, I am no writer of fiction. I am a soldier of the defeated army of 1857. 1857 is, this is the largest anti-colonial rebellion against any European, against any colonial European power um, in the 19th century. And it happened in India, mostly North India, right? Um, so he, uh, he says, I am no writer of fiction. I am a soldier of the defeated army of 1857, but I have not gone into hiding in the jungles of Nepal. Lots of people who, uh, when the British won, uh, sought refuge in Nepal. Um, but I have not gone into hiding in the jungles of Nepal. I live as a fiction writer in the city. I know that the war of 1857 has come to an end. So I do not fight the railway, Dhuangadi, literally smoke car is what he calls it. But yes, the conveyances, Savaria, forms of transport that have been lost in this tumult, I go around tracing them. That is, I do not write fiction. I search for those who have been lost and try to find a trace of the flame of the past. To understand the significance of 1857 in this passage, it is important to know what Intizar Hussain sees as the consequence of this event. In a key essay written soon after, Alamatonga Zawal, The Decline of Symbols, this is the name of a very important work of criticism by 